Good evening, everyone. I hope you can hear me okay. Uh, this is Mark um, coming to you from uh, Midweek Central, which is um, uh, an anonymous alley in, in, in Filey Town, which we'll be talking about more uh, in a little while. Um, thanks for joining us again. Um, it's been a real pleasure doing this. We've still got uh, tonight and tomorrow together. Um, what's been wonderful is walking around. I've been guiding the last few days and birding and the reaction from uh, locals and visitors alike has just been fantastic to what we've tried to do to kind of, you know, make us all feel part of our midweek community, you know, in these uh, challenging times. And it seems to um, seems to be working um, and we're really excited and it's making us really happy and feel connected to everyone. So um, all good so far. Um, a couple of boring things before I get going. Um, Firstly, uh, you'll see in the chat on the side there that there is um, a survey. Uh, it takes a couple of minutes. That helps uh, helps us. It's a kind of, you know, is this format working? Kind of, do you think we're doing it right? Blah, blah, blah. Um, it's good feedback. Uh, you know, it helps in the grand scheme of things. Um, if you can be bothered to fill it out, it takes a couple of minutes. If you can't be bothered, that's completely fine. Um, questions, questions will be really good. Um, I react a lot better to questions than talking to this wall, which I'm looking at right now. Um, so if you can uh, post questions in the chat as we go along during the talk, that would be really handy. I can't see the chat, just so as you know, I'm on a strange Zoom call, which is feeding into YouTube. Uh, it's all above and beyond me, but Anna's taking care of it. Uh, Anna will also be supplying me with the questions. So there's a delay. Um, but I will get your questions via Anna if you can put them um, in the chat as we go along. Um, thanks to everybody for taking part as well. Thanks to everybody for, for helping. I want to thank Yorkshire Wildlife Trust big time for hosting us. Uh, I want to thank RSPB Bempton who've been superb um, and there's some great videos um, on the website which Anna's put together about ringing up there and various other things. Um, there's other videos on the website. There's a really good um, Birders Favourite Memories. So we put out a call uh, via the local groups to, um, to get to put together kind of favourite Birders Memories. And it was like, right, in under a minute, tell us something wonderful about the local area and birds that's happened to you. And has cobbled that together. We've got, I was like 20 participants or something, which is great. Um, it's well worth watching. It's a real kind of weird spectrum of uh, East Coast characters and birding. And we're really happy with that. Um, so do watch that. That's on the website. So uh, scroll down. The website is, has a long name, search for Mini Midweek 2020. That's Mini Midweek 2020. Many of you will have come via that route. Some of you will have come direct to YouTube, but everything's on there. Please do explore it. We've put in a lot of work. And when I say we, I mean Anna. Um, so please enjoy it. Uh, it's really, uh, it's really good stuff. And there's lots of kind of stuff to get the migration juices flowing right there. Um, that's the birders vid, the survey, etc. cetera. Um, I think that might be it for announcement. I should also say tomorrow, uh, is our last talk. So Sunday evening, back to the normal time of, uh, 7 PM is our final talk of the week, our final live talk of the week. Um, and to close proceedings, it's Dave O'Hara, who's the site manager at RSPB Bempton. And he'll be talking about 50 years of seabird monitoring at that majestic, fantastic reserve just up the road from me. Um, that's going to be really worth watching and listening to uh, and, you know, highly educational, I'm sure. It'll be really good stuff. So at 7 p.m. tomorrow via the website, same links, all that stuff. Great. OK, so unfortunately, um, you don't have anybody uh, to um, to kind of counteract uh, just my image right here this evening. It's just me, I'm afraid. So um, there are strange things coming up on the screen, which I'm going to get rid of now. Um, and so it's just me this evening. Um, thanks for tuning in. I appreciate it. Um, what I'm going to talk about this evening is NOCMIG. Uh, what is NOCMIG? Uh, it's a kind of catchy abbreviation uh, for nocturnal migration sound recording, which, you know, sounds like a mouthful. And hopefully you've tuned in thinking he's not going to get too techy because I'm not going to get too techy. That's not uh, my thing at all. You'd be pleased to hear. 
Um, and I'm coming at this very much from, um, from a, an enthusiastic amateur's point of view. So I only started it uh, this year, a few months ago. Uh, there are those who've been doing it for years. There are those who are kind of, you know, grand masters of this stuff. Um, and I wouldn't for one minute uh, pretend that I'm kind of, you know, anything like an expert. I'm an enthusiastic amateur who's learning really fast. And what I'm hopefully trying to portray this evening is, you know, how you can get into it too. It's really easy. It's not that techy. Uh, and the results are just kind of mind bogglingly wonderful and magical. And will just, uh, if you're anything like me, and a migration junkie, they will just, you know, kind of take you to another level, add another kind of an entirely new uh, piece of the spectrum, you know, to, uh, to migration. It's just a wonderful thing. So what is not, like I say, it's nocturnal migration or rather the recording of nocturnal migration, which, you know, in simple terms, in really simple terms, is sticking something that records upwards or outwards at night, leaving it and seeing what happens. Um, that is basically it. And um, thanks for tuning in. Good night. Um, there is a few more things to go over, the first of which is what to use. So we'll start with... Um, you know, what do we use to actually record? Um, simple, you can you can use all kinds of things. That's something else flashing up on my screen, sorry. Um, you can use all kinds of things and there's all kinds of uh, levels of um, quality as well, uh, which, you know, kind of fit in with the price. Um, you'll be pleased to know I use the cheap, cheerful end of things, uh, which works really well for me. I'll explain why as we go along. Um, basically, you can use everything from really, really fancy purpose-built bespoke microphones, uh, parabolics, um, you know, shotgun mics or, you know, specialist, uh, you know, avian sound recording microphones, all of which uh, I'm sure are fantastic. And I would absolutely recommend, um, you know, if you uh, if you want to sell your your third house or whatever. Um, for, for us mere mortals starting, you know, a, a kind of lower or more um, affordable level, um, these are what we use. So in kind of true Blue Peter style, if anybody watching under the age of 40, uh, Blue Peter was a show with lots of kind of DIY stuff on it. Don't worry about it. It was uh, archaic um, and wonderful as well, of course. But what we use for sound recording basically is, uh, I use this, which is uh, an Olympus. I think it's an LS11 or something like that. But I bought this seven or eight years ago, I think, for like 60 quid. Um, and it's a handheld MP3 sound recorder. Um, really small, really light, uh, really handy. Uh, simple, really, you know, simple functions, dead easy to use. And basically this is what I use from my study window. So my study, which is where we're sat right now, uh, as I look out uh, at some lights over Filey, um, is, my main kind of has been my kind of main hub for nocturnal migration recording. Do I have fancy equipment for setting the microphone up? No, I don't. I have some bubble wrap. You can see that, okay. A little bubble wrap jacket for, for, uh, for this little fella. Um, goes in there like so. Uh, plastic bag. This really is um, Blue Peter, isn't it? There's a little plastic bag like so, which is literally it's rain guard, so or dew or whatever it might be. And this, you know, press record. Um, you can use rechargeable batteries, whatever. I actually have a, a power um, power supply for it, which I got off eBay for like two quid or something. Um, stick it in, plug it in. And what I do is I open my study window and literally trap it uh, in the top of the study window, pointing it outwards into the alley um, here in downtown Filey, and that's it. And then I get up in the morning, I come in here, I switch it off, uh, and it's pretty much as simple as that. It's, um, you know, it's a really simple process. And what I would say is, you know, if you can get over the the sort of fear, if you like, of the, um, the software and of then kind of embarking on the ID, you're absolutely fine. Don't let those things uh, stand in your way because it's too much fun to be kind of stalled uh, at that point. Um, yeah, so that's basically it for, uh, for the study recorder. I'm gonna go on and also talk about very briefly later on, 
the North Cliff recorder. So my little family of uh, sound recorders uh, is multiplying slowly uh, for reasons I'll talk about in a while. But uh, that is a lot more technical. Um, it's another sound recorder, again, pretty cheap. This is a Tascam a DR05. Um, again, 60, 70 quid or you can get them for online. Not uh, prohibitively expensive at all. Again, really simple, you know, set your sound levels, press record, that's your lot. Um, and so this is my um, center of operations up on the North Cliff, which if you can see that is yes, a, uh, a water bottle, a large water bottle cut in half uh, and gaffer taped around the top with lots of stones in the bottom to weigh it down, which is also handy for when foxes and deer uh, come sniffing and try and knock it over. That's happened a few times. Some uh, entertaining recordings have come from that. So yeah, that's in the bottom to weigh it down. Um, some kind of packaging in the top and then basically just fitting in that packaging, uh, the recorder goes in like so. And then uh, cling film over the top. Um, I can't believe I'm doing this. This is completely hilarious. I have a career in children's television beckoning um, and covering cling film, tape it tight. It's really important. So there's no um, moisture gets in, but if it's tight, basically if it rains, it's completely fine. It's not going to sag on a, you know, a small surface like this. It will keep it completely protected, just cling film. And you will get effectively no noticeable um, you know, audio issues at all, apart from the bam, 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 bam of the rain as it comes down, which can be pretty pleasant, especially when there's kind of red wings in the background as well. So it's quite a kind of therapeutic tape you'll get anyway, but that's the simple way of doing it. So the whole setup, you know, costs, you know, far less than a hundred quid. Um, like I say, you can, and if you can afford it, probably should, you know, move your way, upgrade if, if you enjoy it uh, and if you really get into it as you go along. So that's the setup. I want to talk about, um, you know, why why I started, um, and hopefully this is quite relatable for a lot of people, um, or rather, what took me so long, I guess, um, because I was aware of it for years. I had uh, several friends already doing it. Um, the birding community, you know, was already kind of uh, talking about it to some degree. It was on the on the radar, uh, the periphery, but certainly on the radar. Um, you know, I'd seen talks about it and it was really interesting. Um, but then basically I'd get home or, you know, um, have a little think about it and be like, well, the reasons not to do it are unfortunately, apparently overwhelming, uh, apparently, uh, you know, kind of knocking it into touch even before I would start. And those reasons were basically, um, I would assume wrongly that it was cost prohibitive. As we just talked about, it's really not. It's... Um, you know, like I say, as much as it takes to get a recorder and as much as it takes to get a memory card that goes in it, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, not a problem regarding um, regarding cost. Uh, time, would I physically have time to do this? Where do you fit it in if you're working and burden and all the rest of it? Um, you can fit it in. It becomes more difficult to fit it in the busier and more successful you become at sound recording. So we'll talk about this last week in a little while. Um, time is an issue right now because I'm out working, burden, whatever, during the days, doing these things at night. Uh, and where do you find the time to go through a lot uh, uh, of recordings? It can be hard. But on a, an average kind of spring night, um, you know, where you're talking maybe, you know, seven or eight hours of recording, there's not, you may get a good suite of species actually going through, but you're not gonna have millions and millions of calls. Um, you know, it can take 45 minutes, an hour, something like that, which is fine if you can fit it in. So, you know, while you're having breakfast and, you know, doing a few things in the morning, you can kind of scroll through quite quickly. Um, another prohibitive factor I assumed would be, um, you know, would basically nullify me doing it was my lack of garden. So I live in, um, I'm very lucky to, to live very close to the sea, only a few hundred meters from the from the coast, but I live in uh, downtown Filey, the main streets of urban Filey, and um, it's effectively concrete. Um, we're talking like, you know, three story buildings. It's very, if you look out into my back alley where I record, it's very Coronation Street, you know, terraced houses, three, four stories high, no gardens. Um, and I thought, well, if I haven't got a garden, 
how can I record? How can I put something out and record? Turns out jamming it in the window works absolutely fine. Um, I don't even need any kind of uh, fake parabolic or whatever to make that work. Um, it works just absolutely fine as it is. Um, I thought there would be too much noise pollution, which you might be thinking if you live in a city or a town, you might think, well, God, there's so much, you know, kind of uh, residual human made noise at night, whether that's planes going over trains, um, people in the street, dogs barking, machinery, etc. It is a problem, don't get me wrong, and it varies quite a lot. But what you will find is you will have significant blocks, unless you're very unlucky, uh, significant blocks of um, analyzable audio to go through, uh, even when uh, you're faced with uh, you know, noise challenges like that. Um, the other big one for me, which apart from all the human made noise, on top of that, I live literally smack bang in the middle of a herring gull colony. Which, um, you know, a lot of love for the herring gulls, uh, red listed, you know, doing really badly, incredibly intelligent bird, etc. Um, try living in the middle of a, uh, a herring gull colony when you're trying to sound record. Um, it's not pretty, let me tell you. It's, uh, it's an interesting experience. It was doable with a lot of patience and with a lot of kind of guile uh, during the spring. It then became uh undoable for a while basically um so we shall see uh you know we'll talk about that i've got a question coming up right now which i will address at the end um so uh thanks for your questions for us keep them coming in don't let that put you off um the ghouls um absolute kind of wailing banshee hades nightmare to listen to on a sonar with headphones trying to pick out you know, the beautiful chirrups of sandpipers when you have uh, uh, when you have the devil screaming in your ears. Um, but like I say, you know, if you're patient enough, there is enough there to work with for success and for rewards. So, yeah, so that's basically my situation um, here in the study. I started it. What were the reasons for starting it? Um, the reasons for me for starting it were, uh, were a combination of things. It was... Um, Obviously, the fact that I could get over those issues we just talked about, uh, which became apparent, you know, in the first few nights. But for me, the inspiration came from a couple of places. The first was, you know, ironically, um, the C word. Um, you know, as soon as uh, COVID began to kick in and the ramifications socially of that began to kick in, uh, if you think back to March, um, suddenly it looked as if kind of birding, birding avenues, if you like, were gonna suddenly close down, you know, lockdown uh, was approaching. Um, suddenly, you know, it seemed as if the choices to get, you know, my birding kicks were, um, were gonna be reducing fast. Um, and so suddenly you start looking at other possibilities. How can I enjoy it? Well, I've got the window, but I've got only a small window of sky, so the, the Visnig isn't gonna be great. Um, what else can I do? Ah, Nokmig. And this came together really nicely with, um, you know, with the uh, coinciding of a really um, epic common scota migration over land. Obviously they're a sea duck, uh, they're uh, on their way to, you know, far flung lands further north, Scandinavia and beyond. Um, but, you know, I saw online via social media, people like, wow, common scoters, you know, uh, lots of noise over me tonight. I was thinking, well, that's nice. Um, you know, I wonder if I'll get to hear any. And um, the end of the final day, the final night of March, and I was in the bathroom brushing my teeth and it was probably, you know, whatever, half 11 at night or something like that. The bathroom window was open. And I heard this just wonderful, beautiful alien sound really really low over the um over the rooftops and it was the gorgeous beeping of a substantial common scoter flock which had clearly um as we now know and as we now understand um you know left uh, the west coast had set off you know from the irish sea or the atlantic or whatever um much earlier and was arriving in its eastbound northeast bound direction uh, those birds were calling like crazy, um, beeping, beeping, beeping like mad at each other and could probably, and that was probably an excited reaction to be able to, you know, smell, hear, see 
the North Sea, that right, we can now get lower, everyone. We've made it to the North Sea, the last leg, you know, is much easier. And for me, that was completely enchanting. And that was like the last straw. I was like, right, you know, screw this. Time to get the recorder out. I'm just going to give it a whirl. If it's all cats and dogs, so what? I've lost nothing. And happily, it wasn't. So even on that first night I put it out, um, lots of results, which, you know, maybe to your sort of seasoned uh, professional mock Miggy, you know, might be quite kind of meagre, but, uh, you know, to me, we're just kind of epic, just having things going over uh, the house. So that was the kind of inspiration uh, to do it. And it was also kind of people starting to talk about a, a community was starting to swell um, online within the birding community. People doing the same thing as I, clearly thinking, well, A, my avenues are closing. Uh, B, there seems to be things happening. People talking about scoters and other things. Why not give it a whirl? So there was this sudden surge of like bobbing along the bottom and a few people a bit into it and people, you know, carrying the torch as it were. And then suddenly, bang, it was a bon bonfire. Um, and Nokmig, you know, exploded as a uh, as a birding pursuit, if you like. Um, it's still growing. Um, lots of people obviously dropped out. They'll probably look at revisiting it with current circumstances. But it's certainly a lot bigger than it was uh, five or six months ago. Right, so I'm going to try and share a few things with you now, folks. Um, Anna, you can tell me if, uh, if this doesn't work, and I'll just have to rely on uh, chatting about stuff. But I'm going to share my screen. And if we can go to uh, a PowerPoint here, hopefully this is going to work. Lovely. So here, if I can just scroll backwards. There is inevitably somewhat of a delay, folks. OK, so yeah, where where am I? Uh, for those of you who are not um, in the UK uh, or even in Europe, uh, that's where we are. Um, bang in the middle of the universe, of course, Yorkshire. Um, that is where I am. Uh, we are on the coast of the North Sea. We're effectively halfway up uh, the east coast of the UK in northern England, um, which is why we're receiving so many wonderful, wonderful waves of migration right now. Uh, from Scandinavia and beyond, which is another talk entirely. My God, I could uh, bang on about that for hours right now, but I won't. So not me wise, that's where we are. Looking a little closer at uh, the map on the left, as you can see, is um, the arrow, the red uh, pin is actually on Filey, and you can see Filey and Flamborough, uh, the two peninsulas sticking out at either end of Filey Bay um, on the map there. And that is a lovely picture from a, a very talented friend of mine, George Stoyle. Um, that is a, a Goldcrest eye view of Filey Brig. So if you're coming across uh, the North Sea in beautiful sunshine with lovely tailwinds, that's what you see. Um, and basically, uh, if you can see my arrow, but I'm very fortunate to live about here. So yes, it's urban. Yes, it's concrete. But three minutes in any direction and you're into quality birding and countryside. So one of my recorders runs from my house here, the other one runs, I'm not gonna tell you exactly where, but somewhere in this area up here. So that's where my two fire recorders run. And that's the view from my study. Um, it is, like I say, very kind of Coronation Street-esque. This was on a really lovely night with uh, a very bright moon uh, a few months ago, but, um, that is what it is. It is pointing out into the back alley. It's not, uh, there's no habitat to speak of. There's no ground habitat uh, for migrants of any kind whatsoever, which is actually, you know, obviously works um, against you in the sense that, um, you know, there isn't that variety around, there isn't that structure and variety of habitats around, but it also works massively in your favor in the sense that anything you get on tape is, is flying over, you know it's flying over and is more than likely a migrant. So there's no kind of, you know, what you might call pollution from um, the, you know, from a significant dawn chorus, which you would get in most places. All I've got is the ghouls. Um, all I've got is the ghouls. Um, so basically, you know, you can be fairly sure, you can be in some cases 100% sure, especially with, for example, insectivorous migrants, that, um, that what you're recording is a migrant. So it's really fascinating to have that. I didn't really appreciate that until it started to, to happen with the Notmig. 
So just to run through the first kind of few months, just to give you a flavor of sort of my journey, if you like, um, April was the beginnings of it. So end of March, common scoters, beeping, incredible. Um, scoters were the first thing. Um, wonderfully, uh, I got them instantly. The, the first night I recorded, I got big flocks of common scoters going over. But in that first month, I had other wildfowl as well. So I had flocks of widgeon and teal. I had a couple of potchard, which was fantastic. Uh, a few mallard some of which were maybe local birds, others of which were, you know, uh, perhaps migrants, I'm sure were migrants. Um, a wonderful thing about Nokmig is that you will suddenly get used to certain standard species. Um, and those species are um, coot and moorhen are two of those standard kind of iconic Nokmig species. Um, would you imagine that? I don't know what I would like you to imagine is that when you're listening to them on the sonogram, you know, these birds are flying over with their ridiculous legs kind of dangling over your chimney pots, um, flying around migrating to the coots and the moorhens, the water rail, little grebe, you know, these are kind of water birds on the move in April, which were regular um, on my knock make in the middle of town. And I'll keep reminding you of this, surrounded by concrete, no habitat, and clearly going over as you hear them approach the microphone, as you hear them go away, um, it's marvellous. So even at that point, if you could stop there, if I did two nights of not making, it would still be fascinating. The fact that um, coot and moorhen fly over my house low is just fantastic, really. So there's a few graphs here. I'm not going to bore you with too many graphs. I started going mad on the graphs and I thought, mm, that's not really... Uh, as entertaining as it might be. So here's just a few to, uh, to give you an idea. This is from Trek Talent, and I want to advertise Trek Talent more so at the end. But Trek Talent is a wonderful website for uh, recording migration, visible migration, sea watching, and now NOCMIG. And you put your data in for every day, which I'll show you later on, but it can spit out all kinds of graphs and data uh, for you to interpret. It's really wonderful. And here's the common scoter numbers. Um, look where the peak is. Uh, this huge, huge peak uh, in the first week of April, and I still got them as it went along, and I still get a few now up at the North Cliff, so I had even a few in the summer as well, that post-breeding dispersal, that uh, early migration of common scoters. But look at that, through the roof as soon as I, uh, as soon as I started recording. More things in April. So you had this brilliant thing where it, um, it corresponds beautifully with your daytime bird watching, and in fact, I was going to say enhances it, but in some respects it actually eclipses it. So. How many red wings uh, and field fares and a misspelt thrushes there? You can tell I was in a rush today. Um, you know, how many of those do you, do you physically see exiting for Scandinavia? Not that many. They're pretty quiet um, diurnally in the spring. But on the tapes, you can hear them. It's fantastic. So you've got red wings, blackbirds, song thrushes, field fares exiting for Scandinavia overnight here on the coast in Flyley. Um, and shorebirds started to arrive in good numbers. So oyster catcher numbers were a big feature. Clearly oyster catchers follow the coast quite tightly um, around here. And there was big movements of oyster catchers uh, in the spring, but then more and more species as, as the month wore on. So um, there's an example of oyster catchers. So actually pretty constant. So April was really good, May. So mid, late May was really big movements of oyster catchers. Um, and then they start, you know, dribbling through again, um, end of August, September, October. Um, maybe we'll see more of them in the next few weeks. Maybe not. It's going to be interesting to see. Uh, Wimbrel, which is, you know, a long distance migrant, of course, um, again, peaks early. So uh, from the study, uh, peaked late April, early May. I had one or two since. I had a late bird uh, just uh, 10 days ago. Curlew, really interesting. Uh, there's two significant peaks there. There was one really early on in April. And there was another one um, in uh, mid to late June and early July, which is, again, corresponds really well with site records. So um, you will see Curlew was one of the kind of, um, you know, uh, leading species, if you like, of autumn migration. I know that sounds really early for end of June, early July, but that's when we, you know, we look at autumn migration beginning as birders on the coast, we think, well, it's waders first, and it's often curlews first. They're at the vanguard uh, of autumn migration. Common sandpipers. So again, you know, another pretty long distance migrant um, peaking. And it's great to hear that sound. Uh, we'll, we'll play it later on if it works. Um, but again, peaking in April, early May, and then just dropped off completely. So there was a 
mad rush of birds through at that point. And fantastically with Apus, we had this whole suite of kind of waders and the ducks and especially the scout was a very exciting. But they were th it was throwing up surprises already. And, you know, to a, especially to an enthusiastic kind of newbie amateur at this game, this was really fascinating. And this is where, like, um, I really love kind of the hive mind of, you know, social media and the birding community because we, when I say we, uh, there's a few of us who knock me locally. We've got a little WhatsApp group where we discuss things. There's Dan uh, in Crossgates near Scarborough. There's Will in Humanby. Uh, there's Jared also in Filey. And we've got a little kind of uh, community, you know, where we uh, contrast and compare and help each other out with calls. But a few of us were, get, were getting this happening. And I noticed the wider community. As soon as I put this up on Twitter, I was like, I just had a black cap. Uh, singing like sub singing over my house in the early hours and you can hear it come and go completely bizarre reminding you again that there is no habitat for a black cap at all here and there was you know one or two people online saying god that, that doesn't happen you know uh warblers you know don't sing on migration in the spring and you're like well okay you know best but clearly not because what we went and found out via the hive mind and via the community that people right around these nights were getting exactly the same thing happening on the coast, in towns, and clearly black caps were having this kind of wonderful little version of their song, this MIG singing, if you like, um, overnight. And they had two at the end of April, and we were really excited about that. We were all sharing this black cap migration. So a small scrub warbler migrating, like I say, over the rooftops right here, just fantastic, audibly through the herring gull colony. That's what I want to give you as an example of how hard it can be. It got a lot harder than this, but there is a lot of mess on my sonogram. Um, and in there, can you spot the interest in call? Probably not. It's an awful exercise to put you through. But basically, that's how the sonogram comes out. That's actually in stereo. I normally do it in mono now, just one band. Where you scroll through 30 seconds at a time, click, click, click. So you can do eight, nine, ten hours in about an hour or something like that. But with the herring gulls, it's very challenging, but I wasn't gonna let them beat me. And uh, I had minor significant victories many times. And one of those is, if you can see the arrow, um, just there. And that wonderfully was towards the end of April. And I clicked on that and thought that looks non herring gull like, looks a bit like a wader. Wonderfully, it was a green shank. So that was my, my first green shank um, of the spring. And there it is in the flesh, as you would see at a local nature reserve. So May, the variety expanded really quickly. So it was good enough as it was, but May, as you would hope, uh, in tandem with um, diurnal migration and what you've seen on the ground and in the skies, um, it worked beautifully. So shorebirds were diversifying with loads of new additions, such as turnstones and not and sandalings, which was just wonderful. Um, sandwich terns screeching over the house, Arctic tern brilliantly. Um, and passerines, so a yellow whack tail, which you would not necessarily expect nocturnally, but there it was. And again, we've had a bunch of those. A spotted flycatcher, which is known as, um, you know, a fairly prominent knockmig migrant. Um, they're clearly quite prone to call uh, while they're nocturnally migrating. Robins, uh, which is great to hear. And more surprises in May. So on top, and almost almost a trump. Um, I really shouldn't use that word uh, this month of all months, but. To, uh, to almost outdo um, the black cap we talked about earlier, um, lesser white throats. So amazing Sylvia warblers, you know, long distance trans saharan migrants. Again, we all had lesser white throats rattling, that beautiful rattle they have over our rooftops. I had them, you know, really close, could not believe what I was hearing. There's some awful gulls in the background there, but it was properly, properly audible. And incredibly, this is where you just think, well, it's worth it. This is working out so wonderfully. I have not one but two um, quail, which are again, you know, very scarce around these parts. Um, Trans-Saharan migrant, small, long-distance game bird, enigmatic, decreasing rapidly, um, and to have the recording of two quails calling as they migrate on their, you know, this huge distance as they migrate through. Uh, the herring gull colony uh, where I live uh, and onwards, who knows where they ended up. Um, just an incredible buzz, you know, and the buzz to pick it out of the sonogram to be like, well, that looks, those little lines look interesting. I'll press play. 
and I'll uh, play what it sounded like in a little while. A few other things come from the sonogram, which um, are clearly not birds. Uh, that is the beautiful pattern, um, not of um, an 80s jumper, but of uh, a car alarm. So often you will get pretty patterns like that. I think that's even prettier. That is um, the very Art Deco um, kind of impression of the coppers. There you go. So that's the sound of the police right there. Uh, June. So June, um, there was a kind of uh, changing of the guard. Um, and there's a general slowdown with peaks of water rail, more hen, more spot fly catches, um, plus more shorebirds, including the first uh, black tailed godwit, which was really exciting. Chip, chip, chipping excitedly as it went over my roof. But the goals finally prevailed. So I'd fought them hard. I'd won a few rounds. You know, I was happy with uh, how far it had gone. But by June, it was just um, an intolerable, pointless wall of doom. Um, which looked like that. And you think, well, maybe he's just chopped a little bit out of the worst part. If you can imagine eight hours of that, um, sitting down to it and thinking, mm, can I find a subtle little song or call of something there? No, you're not going to bother. So that was where. Um, basically, oh, there's another lovely image of um, herring gulls. Um, that's actually young herring gulls. So by that time of year, you've not only just got the adults going crazy, you've got the young, which have a really wide range of equally hideous um, audio nightmares. That is the call of uh, a young herring gull, not Hattie Fatness, which um, Moomin's fans will be aware of. So even though it looks like Hattie Fatness, sadly not, it was herring gulls. And Moomin's fans will know that Hattie Fatmans are indeed migrants as well, but sadly not on the Nokomig yet, legitimately. So that made, that kind of forced my hand to think, well, what can I do? I'm loving this, but it's pointless from the house. Uh, Thunderbird 2, so T2 right there. And I should thank uh, Rich from Yorkshire Coast Nature, the wonderful company I thank for, uh, I work for, uh, thankfully, um, for supplying the recorder. So I have recorders at my disposal and they're the Yorkshire Coast Nature kind of Thunderbird team out there. Uh, so Thunderbird 2 was positioned, was launched in mid-July, um, instant success up on the Filey North Cliff. So it's up um, near the cliff top, as I showed you on the map, um, in a field, in a plastic bottle with cling film. And suddenly it was just wonderful. I instantly got loads of waders, including knot, flocks of knot, turnstones, more little ring plovers I didn't re re refer to earlier. They're a really distinctive, um, easy sound to pick up on the knot make loads of more hens, even more terns, sandwich terns, arctic terns. And then what, just two weeks, less than two weeks into it, boom, quite literally. Um, incredibly a bitten, so it was a really quiet night. I think I had maybe a couple of curlew on the same night or something like that. But one really clear recording of this call, which frankly, I didn't know what it was because it wasn't a typical um, bitten call. It wasn't even a typical bitten flight call. Uh, but thankfully, you know, phone a friend, Thankfully, you've got uh, more learned, uh, experienced colleagues around you. And this was confirmed as uh, Eurasian bitten, which is knock make gold right there. So the North Cliff in, North Cliff in August, as time, uh, as time went on, um, floods of waders. So especially in the second half of August, um, really exciting. Just opening your sonogram and thinking which species are going to be on here. But it was black tailed and bar tailed godwits. It was more sandalings, which have a really wonderful conversational chatter kind of right across the sauna. Huge oyster catcher movements, return movements of birds, you know, uh, finishing breeding and juveniles, uh, you know, plowing south and west. Even more turns and fantastically more knockmig gold in the shape of a short-eared owl, which beautifully coincided with a mini arrival of short-eared owls during that 48 hours on the coast, including here at Filey. So I even got a short eared owl on my knock make up there, just wonderful. Um, North Cliff in September. So I'm focused uh, mainly on the recorder up there at this point. I tried a few times in August to see if the ghouls would, you know, would let me back in. No, they wouldn't. The, uh, the door was, you know, still slammed firmly shut. So I persisted with North Cliff, which I should say was beautiful from an analyzing point of view because Ironically, it'd been close to the North Cliff. Um, very little noise pollution from gulls, which tells its own story. Uh, how ironic that that's perhaps where they should be making a lot of noise, but sadly aren't. Um, but this beautiful, clear, grey sonogram where you can easily see 
any noises that are coming out. So going from the study uh, to this analysis of the North Cliff was just like paradise. You know, suddenly it just became so much easier to pick things out. It's like being born again, knock me wise, just within a few months. So the weight has kept coming through, although the um, a lessening species dynamic by September, um, there's still lots going on, but here come the passerines. So it's really exciting. And I was hoping we were going to pick up passerines much harder to hear, um, you know, much less clear often. And without the fancier gear, uh, you're less likely to pick them up. Uh, this is where I thought the shortcomings of the cheaper end uh, of the gear would, would let me down. Not the case. So at night, migrating skylarks, migrating tree pipits, robins, um, are one of the sort of standard stock, really class um, autumn migrants in September, they really start to kick off. Even a gold crest, which was wonderful. I've recorded this see, 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 as they uh, as a gold crest goes over my microphone up on the cliff top there, fresh in more than likely, uh, you know, from well, very far afield at the very least. Even better. We'd fantasized about it between us. Wouldn't it be amazing? Wow, the, the classiest, the kind of, uh, you know, king of knock recordings would be a yellow-browed warbler. And lo and behold, on the 29th of September, when the first major wave of yellow-browed warblers arrived in the UK from Siberian forests, um, after dusk on my recording, I can listen to the, uh, the dawn chorus goes quiet, and then there's a long stretch of absolute silence, you can hear a pin drop. And then just as I start analyzing, there's the perfect call, um, as you can see on the sonogram there, just about uh, a double call of a yellow browed warbler going past my recorder. So incredible and just wonderfully exciting. Um, yeah, it's almost like you should retire at that point. Um, so Thunderbird 3 came into action at that point. I couldn't really get enough, decided to completely overload myself going into the autumn. You know, uh, complete migration immersion took place, is taking place, I should say. And wonderfully, thanks to uh, my mom and stepdad, John, they've kindly facilitated me um, placing a recorder in their village garden in Flamborough, which is the headland just over the bay. A wonderful bird observatory, of course. Um, but it's in the garden in the village. And the village is actually, even though it's at Flamborough, it's actually set further back than both my filey. Uh, recording facilities, both my fire recorders. It's actually a couple of kilometers inland, which I thought would impact the species dynamic and would prove an interesting comparison. Fascinatingly, the big thing that I found out about Flamborough, which is another talk entirely really, but was the amazing weight of variety in abundance, including big movements of sandling, knots, oyster catchers, massive movements of red shank and more. I had the first wood sandpiper up there, which was fantastic. But from a wader's point of view, would the waders be happy completely cutting off the tip of Flamborough Head and uh, flying north-south between North London and South London, which if you look on a map, you know, it's completely cutting off uh, Flamborough Head. And they did. Clearly it's a migration path where the birds can sense, smell, hear, see the ocean on the other side and think, well, there's absolutely no point doing the long diversion, let's cut across. That diversion is straight across the village straight over the recorder. So that also provided me with first recordings of tree pipit and red wing. So red wing on the 17th of September, I didn't see another red wing for another, I didn't see a red wing physically this autumn for another 10 days, two weeks or something. So uh, yeah, the first red wing um, was via Nockmig. And then back to the autumn, so back to October, back to the study. Um, and I wanna show you a little bit more about um, uh, how you can access this and how you can search for this uh, and enjoy it online yourselves. Uh, but the 7th of October, um, I've been putting the recorder back out again um, in the last few weeks. It's been going incredibly well, or at least it's kind of grown as, as the days have gone by. 7th of October, okay, there's quite a few goals, but lots of gaps as well, thankfully. And these three calls were in there, and I thought that really sounds like a dotterel. But, um, you know, hold your horses. That's a big, filey bird. You know, quails are rare enough. Bittern is barely annual. Dotterel, there's another thing entirely there. Every few years, if you're lucky. Um, but I was like, that really sounds like a dotterel. You know, early hours, uh, the 7th of October, and sent it to, uh, sent it to Magnus. Magnus Robb, who's just a brilliant kind of um, knock mig uh, demigod and um, confirmed it straight away as, um, as dotterel. So just 
completely ecstatic, ecstatic to get a daughter all again migrating over my rooftops over the chimney pots of Filey. Um, I'm probably not going to see a daughter all. I may not see another daughter in Filey, you know, for years, but um, there it is over my uh, my sleeping head. So October, you know, here comes the flood, and the flood is happening right now. Um, after a slow start to the month. Um, I've not even got around to analyzing a lot of the Flamber recordings yet. That's a job uh, I'll try and get around to when things slow down a little bit. But for the fire recordings, lots going on with the North Cliff recorder, um, but even more going on over the study recorder. And this is really fascinating for me because I thought, well, the North Cliff recorder is probably gonna kind of overshadow my study because of its limitations, the back alley, the concrete, that kind of stuff, the, uh, the noise pollution, not the case in autumn, just brilliant. So passerines, including bramblings and chaffinches are going over huge thrust migration, which was, we anticipated thrush migration, not to these degrees, was really hoping for it, but bigger over the North Cliff, like I say, even bigger over the house. Um, just really, really wonderful scenes. And if I exit the screen here, um, I'm actually going to play you a few things. Um, here's a few recordings that I was talking about. How are we doing for time? Of course, I'm overrunning. Um, I hope everybody's still with me. Um, yeah, I wanted to play you a few of the recordings. They're not terrific. Hopefully they're audible and they'll give you an idea of uh, the standard ones that I'm looking out for, listening for, and a few of the special ones. So the bittern sounded like this. So it's a little bit fiddly on uh, on audacity, but give me a second. Turn that up. It sounds like this. Just amazing, really. So um, one call enough to absolutely nail uh, uh, that bitten, which was just fantastic stuff. So you have to bear with me with this tech stuff, but you've got um, yeah, black cap. So here's a little recording of the black cap going. On. Try that again. The audible snatch of Black Cap song. Um, there's a brambling from just last week in the rain. So listen for the raindrops. Um, it's not a relaxation tip. Listen for the beautiful wheeze of uh, arguably the best finch on the planet. On a red wing at the end, of course. Uh, other things, here's the dotterel. Let's see if you can make this out, folks. It's relatively distinctive, he says, kind of uh, having researched it quite a lot. Three calls, three chills. Enough to nail it. Not the prettiest thing, but hey, to me, it certainly is. Um, this is a great Dunlin flock. I think this is a bit more entertaining uh, from a holistic point of view. So here's a Dunlin flock approaching my study window over the back alley. Sure. Um, let's have a listen to Green Sandpiper. So that was one which, you know, a familiar call during the day. Sounds like this. Uh, hope to hear a wetland. Um, I'm not going to keep you too long, but I'm just going to pick out a few highlights here. I've got to play you a lesser white throat. So again, uh, going back to what we were talking about. Small uh, Trans-Saharan migratory uh, passerine over the rooftops of an urban area migrating, gunning all the spooky um, 
kind of low level woofs of the herringle in the background. Listen for the chur, the ch -ch 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 chur of the lesser white throat. <laughs> and plenty of other stuff. Um, let's have a listen. You get some surprises. Um, oh, this is a really beautiful red shank flock, which was from Flambra. This flock, who knows how large it was, because it took uh, more than three minutes to pass over the microphone. So it was just this endless flock of red shank. And you can see their, their sonogram looks kind of like dozens and dozens of Loch Ness monsters kind of plodding along there. <laughs> Play it back. This is where it gets really fascinating. You're like, is that something else in there? Can you pick something else out? And often waders that are in uh, mixed flocks, at least here. Um, what else have we got? So the yellow browed warbler, have to play here. See if you can hear this, folks. It's squeaky and it's high, so I apologize for for those who struggle with higher frequencies, but um, this, bear in mind, is going past my microphone um, after dark uh, in late September. Try it once more, see if you can get it. Yeah, so fantastic. The quintessential sound of the East Coast autumn. Um, couple more just to finish on but this is one of my favorites and this is from what two three nights ago there's a massive flood uh, of thrushes um and it was just absolutely incredible but this is five o'clock in the morning how do i know it's five o'clock in the morning well i do keep the time on the thing but better still there's church bells and there is the full selection of thrushes uh, going through the church bells so You'll hear the five chimes of the local church, five o'clock in the morning. You'll hear field fair, blackbird, red wing, and then a very faint song thrush right at the end. See if you can pick them out. Amazing. So migrating five o'clock in the morning, I had the field fair blackbird, song thrush, red wing, you know, effectively within sight of each other, uh, you know, gunning in from Scandinavia inland at the same time, uh, complete with church bells. It doesn't get much more uh, England in the autumn than that, does it? Um, this one is, see if you can uh, guess what it might be. Um, it's very strange and very loud. So that is what you might call um, knockmig collateral. So I mentioned earlier, um, I get noises from shrews, I get noises from foxes, uh, barn owls, and um, even our barn owls amazingly over the house uh, here in the Filey town. Uh, but this, as you'll see from the date, that's 13th of September, suddenly lots of ridiculous tawny owl noise. Um, so young birds getting kicked off territories uh, conflict between adults and young birds, you know, as they're kind of uh, hassled on to make their own way in the world. But clearly, this was right next to the microphone, kind of ridiculous sound. And just to finish on, I've got to play the quail. Pretty faint, but enough. 
Um, and finally, see if you can recognize this. Um, this was, um, let's see, 26th of June, uh, a sound recording um, from relatively distantly from the study window, um, early hours of the morning. The date roughly gives you a clue. Uh, football fans will already have a clue regarding the acronym. But this is what I picked up very early hours of the morning on the, uh, the 26th of June. See if you recognize this really, really beautiful sound. <laughs> you'll agree that's true uh knock me gold and that is some very drunk liverpool fans uh celebrating um their winning the premiership isn't that a very beautiful thing right folks just to end with i appreciate uh, i've kept you a long time um for those of you who um who've been to my physical talks you'll know that uh, i like to crack on quite a lot uh often a little bit too much but um just to finish on just to show you um in the context of where we are now, migration happening on the East Coast. Um, you know, we're getting absolutely floods of migrants from Scandinavia and beyond. Um, and the thrushes, the, the thrushes I was referring to, uh, just, you know, incredible volumes. But you can kind of access this information uh, online and you can follow what's happening online. Like I say, the best resource, as far as I'm concerned, um, is Trek Talent. So that's trektalent.org. Um, just a wonderful free open access resource where you can record your migration counts, whether it's Visnig or Sea Watching, you set up a site. Um, and it is this wonderful resource, which, like I say, spits out fantastic graphs and data sets, uh, which you know you can use to interpret um, your own kind of hard won migration studies, if you like. And this is just uh, so you would go to uh, home. Uh, and down there, you would have a list and Filey Town, which is my uh, study window recorder. And here it is for October. Um, so the dates, the days, individual days are at the top here. The first, nothing, just down Herringles. The second, a late Wimbrel, that was good, called 10 times and a few of the bits and bobs. Um, a bit more there. So Red Wings, Blackbird, Song Thrush, that's good. Golden Plover, you know, things starting to get a bit more active. Uh, dead again on the third. Um, Song thrush, red wing, not bad. Grey heron, moor hen was the first for a while. And you think, well, it's going okay. And then the sixth, uh, not only my first uh, big flock of pink-footed geese uh, uh, migrating nocturnally, but the dotterel, just absolutely fantastic. Uh, and a few thrushes. And then snipe, that was nice. Um, Again, nothing there and you think, well, you know, is it really gonna kick off? Yes, it is. And so as you can see the night of Saturday the 10th, so exactly a week ago, um, the first night of our virtual MIG week, in fact, uh, this is what happened. And wonderfully, there was um, a massive influx of thrushes. I thought at the time, you know, exceptional, possibly, uh, record, personal record, you know, for me, um, and that wonderful brambling I played you earlier, a grey plover, which sounded like this. Cool. But then at 0345 in the morning, it all kicked off. And this massive thrush influx happened, just constant noise of sips and seeps and ticks. Um, and I thought, you know, that's going well. That was a great night. I'm really glad that happened. And then fast forward to, what, three nights ago, Tuesday night, this happened. And we were kind of in awe and in shock 
at this wonderful occurrence where it was basically faced with a, a sonogram which was a wall of noise of incoming thrushes, constant bam, 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 all the way through the night, uh, almost impossible to count, massive underestimate, because all we're talking there is the ones which are audibly picked up, They're only the ones which are calling. So it's a massive underestimate, but there you go. This was a record black, blackbird count for Trek Talon, 783 registrations, 2,318 Red Wings uh, registrations, loads of song thrushes, robins, my first two ring oozles. Just a really magnificent experience. And you can kind of access this or even start it yourself as your uh, database, your data set. Um, this is the best way to record. It's really simple. Get in touch with me by all means if you want to you know, hear about how it's done. I didn't really touch, touch on too much the analysis of the spectrogram. Um, and I should explain that that is via a program called Audacity, which is very simple, free software. You open up your sound file, which you've recorded via a memory card or whatever. It opens in Audacity and there it is on a gray band. You reduce the size of the window to 30 seconds that you're clicking along with and you have it in 30 second chunks to check and you can stop and play and save and blah, blah, blah as you go along. There are brilliant instructions, I should say, on how to work that on a great site called knockmig.com. So just simple as that, knockmig.com. Um, there's instructions even as to how to set up your audacity. It's a brilliant crash course for beginners. I used it and even I managed, you know, with relatively few obstacles to get there very quickly. Um, and the other wonderful resource which I'd like to mention is the sound approach. So Google sound approach, I think it's soundapproach.org.uk a magnificent resource site with calls and explanations and you can really kind of deep dive uh, into this world right there. But I've gone way too long, sorry folks, but as you can probably understand, really enthusiastic about this. You know, like I say, from an amateur's point of view, this is not, I'm not an expert in this field by any means. It's just um, like all migration, the more you find out and the more you access it, the more exciting it seems to become. Um, and it's just been a great journey so far. And it's, you know, it's set to get even better. The more I learn about it, uh, you know, and the more used to it uh, I become. So it's um, hopefully that's given you a kind of, uh, you know, a crash course or at least a relatable kind of intro into the world of knockmig, into the world of uh, nocturnal migration recording. Um, I'm probably going to call it quits there, even though I've got lots more to say to you guys. Um, and look at the uh, chat. Hang on one second. Um, if we can go back to uh, full screen. So the, uh, see, this is where my um, tech hell um, stop share. There we go. Hooray, that seems to have worked. Right, chat. Here we are back to chat. And there's 13 questions. Wow, who, who's still with us? Probably nobody. Um, but I'm going to talk to my friends. So. Questions are along the side here, and I'm going to run down them as quickly as I can and cherry pick. Um, okay, battery life from Tony. Will the sound recorder record for a six, eight hour period overnight? Rechargeable batteries absolutely do for the Knockmig recorder um, on the North Cliff. I use Duracell rechargeable batteries, uh, and they easily last a full night, even if that night is 13 hours long. Um, regular batteries, maybe not. Uh, that might not be a great idea, but you can also get power packs. I know friends of mine use power packs, which, um, you know, will last three or four nights at a time before you recharge them. They're like 20, 30 quid, something like that. Um, okay. Um, messages from Anna there. Uh, one from Anne. Um, any recordings you made look out for the bird the following morning? That's a really good question. And no, uh, in short, in fact, it's kind of a, it's a really nice thing about knockmig in the sense that it it kind of blunts the sharp end of that bird finding uh you know kind of edge which is great diurnally and i love finding scarcities and rarities and that kind of uh you know adrenaline rush and all that kind of stuff but the beauty of knockmig is it's either on your tape or it's not and it's gone it's gone by the next morning forget about it you know unless okay, maybe if you're recording next to a wetland and you hear a little bitten coming in, sure, go and look for a little bitten or whatever. But in my circumstances, there's just no point at all. Like if it's on the recording and it's identifiable, 
you've bagged it and it's beautiful, you know, and it's not a problem really. Uh, there isn't that kind of pressure. There isn't that um, expectation to think, oh God, put, got to put the news out. Is it, isn't it? Who do I tell? Blah, blah, blah. None of that nonsense. It's just, uh, it's either there or it's not on your recording the night before. Um, have you looked at the Pippet recording from All Fall? <laughs> yeah, that's funny. And we had a Pippet in All Fall today, which was either Tree Pippet or OBP. No, Rob, I've not had a chance, unfortunately. I'm not going to have a chance tonight or tomorrow, but um, I'll get around to it, I promise. Message me again. Do you keep the recordings for reference or tape over them? The digital thing, thankfully, and means that, um, you know, they're easy to keep and record uh, and store. I keep, as you saw, um, excerpts of recordings for reference. Um, and I do keep some nights. So the recent thrush, huge influxes I've kept for posterity. Um, and also fascinatingly, because you'll listen to a chunk of it again, and you will find listening to it as opposed to visually analyzing it, there's a lot more thrushes going through that you can hear, but which are not recognizable as shapes on the sonogram. Uh, what software are you using to view the sonograms, Mark, from Simon? Hi, Simon. Um, Audacity. So yeah, the free, it's fantastic, free downloadable software um, called Audacity. You can get better um, and more accurate and uh, more detailed, rather, I should say, um, paying software, if you like. You can get uh, Raven Pro and things like that. I believe Raven Lite is also free, which some people use. But it's amazing that you can get this free software. You know, what an age we live in where you can just, uh, you know, it takes a few minutes to download and suddenly you're up and away with your, your sonograms. Uh, the peak water rail in June, when you would expect them to be breeding, that's a really good question. Not sure. Um, it may be birds getting kicked off territories, which haven't found one, maybe latecomers. It may be failed breeders. Um, there are people who will know that better than I, absolutely. Um, and fascinating. Uh, thanks, Tony, for your good comments. Do you have any feeling for what I might hear properly in land in Leeds? So that's a really good question and what I wanted to touch on, and I'm really glad you mentioned it. Another great thing about Knockmig, you might think, well, look at him, you know, fancy pants on the coast. He's like filling his boots with all this amazing migration um, and rubbing our noses in it. The greatest thing about Knockmig, do it anywhere, do it in land. There are some incredible results. There's no reason why you shouldn't get um, not just a variety, uh, but also, you know, rarities. There's no reason why you wouldn't get the dotterel or the bittern or something better. Um, bang in the middle of the country, you know, let's say in Birmingham, why not? Birds are migrating at night and they may fly over your machine. It's that simple. Um, the fact that we don't see them is our problem. And the fact that we record them is our gain, isn't it? You know, so wherever you are in the country, um, so long as it's not incredibly loud where you live, you will get results. You know, even if you go outside tonight and uh, leave your phone on for a while, you'll probably get a few red wings or whatever. You know, it's, um, it's magic stuff. So do it anywhere is the short answer. Um, absolutely in Leeds, do it. We'd love to hear what you're getting as well. Um, recordings, guesstimate. Um, <laughs> nice message from Anna there saying, stop sharing screen and press chat. Thank you for that. Um, does the recording help with guesstimating the number of birds in the flock? It's really hard. Um, here's an example. Um, I watched after dark 26 curlews fly over my house in the street lights here in a flock, um, one bird called and one bird was picked up on the spectrogram. So um, that tells its own story. You're getting an absolute fraction of the birds which are actually passing over. Some birds are more vocal than others, of course, and some birds react to street lights. I think the reason why I'm getting so many thrushes is because A, I'm on the coast, and B, the artificial lights attracts and excites them to call more, to kind of focus and channel in uh, to where I am uh, here in Filey Town. So there's all kinds of kind of ramifications, I think, which make, make differences there. Um, I hope that makes sense. Um, I may even have been cut off. I'm not sure. But um, I would say thank you very much for joining me, folks. It's really fantastic. Um, thanks for your feedback this week. We will see you uh, tomorrow night, and uh, we very much uh, appreciate your support.